today. Uh, we have two speakers, and our, our first speaker is Michaela Dynan, who's an associate professor of epidemiology and co-leader of the Yale Cancer Center Cancer Prevention and Control Research Program. She joined us from Duke University last year and is a health sciences researcher specializing in using epidemiological methodologies to study complex data sets with a particular expertise in leveraging existing real world data sets to ex examine uh, cancer outcomes. She's also a leading um, researcher uh, or leading um, an NI NCI funded study looking at um, health disparities in patients with kidney cancer. And so um, I think we'll hear about some of that today. So Michaela, welcome and uh, I have to, do I have to unmute? Great, just pulling up my slides here. Okay, looks like we're ready to rock and roll. All right, so thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm actually in Chicago right now, um, attending the Astro Annual Meeting. So technically it's still morning uh, here, but either way, I'm delighted to be speaking with you today. So um, as was mentioned, I'm a health outcomes researcher by training and I can bucket my current research projects into three broad categories, including emerging technology and oncology, survivorship and patient outcomes and molecular oncology outcomes research. But the running theme throughout these example projects is leveraging real world data to answer questions about dissemination, outcomes, costs and disparities and how I think about answering these types of questions using real world data resources. So what is the value added of health outcomes research? And while RCTs are considered higher up in the food chain uh, than cohort and case control studies in the traditional levels of evidence pyramid shown here, there are many types of questions that are not feasible to examine in the context of a trial, but that are feasible within health outcomes study methodologies. And here are some examples of the types of questions we can answer about emerging diagnostics and therapeutics using real world data resources. Randomized trials are required before approval of a novel therapeutic agent, but approvals of diagnostics and other biomarkers are more complex and not always evaluated by RCTs prior to their approval or um, coverage by insurance. However, even for therapeutic agents, initial approvals often arise from RCT comparisons with another single treatment, which may be outdated by the time approval is received. In reality, more and more cancers have increasing numbers of possible treatment options and combinations, and it's just not feasible to examine all possible treatment strategies in a head-to-head -head fashion. And oftentimes there's honestly not adequate financial incentives to support such trials. Uh, we also know that patients who participate in RCTs differ systematically from the average real world patient where life and treatment is just a lot messier as compared to the highly curated patient population and controlled environment of an RCT. And this is an example study, not mine, um, of a patient uh, of patients with primary CNS lymphoma treated at the same institution who received the same treatment both on and off protocol. And uh, the investigators showed that patients who were treated in the real world practice, meaning off protocol, were older, sicker, had worse disease, and had dramatically worse survival than the patients who were treated on the clinical trial. So here I have presented an overview of many different types of data that can be used to conduct real world health outcomes research. And what I really wanna drive home is that it's important to remind folks that there is no perfect single data set, uh, but by leveraging the major strengths and weaknesses of different, data, uh, different types of data sets as they currently exist or improving upon them, we can answer some pretty cool questions. So this is an example of a past fully completed study that I conducted in breast cancer. And this was a five-year study that was funded by AHRQ where we were looking at adoption, chemotherapy use and costs associated with Oncotype DX uh, in, in breast cancer. And a lot has changed in the subsequent years since this work was completed, but at the time NCCN guidelines recommended consideration of chemotherapy in all of early stage disease patients with primary tumors greater than one centimeter, node negative, ER positive disease, and patients characteristics that were consistent with chemotherapy candidacy. And Oncotype DX was still relatively new to the scene at this time and no one had looked at its use in real world population based studies. 
So let's consider the gaps in knowledge that existed at the time. So we know that randomized trials had confirmed the prognostic and predictive value of Oncotype DX. And there had been some single institution series that suggested that decreased uh, chemotherapy was associated with Oncotype DX use. However, there hadn't been any nationally representative studies um, conducted. Uh, there were still questions about whether uh, or not the adoption and diffusion of Oncotype DX was being done equitably across the different um, subgroups in the population. And there were questions about the impact that Oncotype DX was having on chemotherapy utilizations and costs in the real world. And finally, there was limited data on patients who were 65 years and older because these were underrepresented in any of the trial data. So in thinking about the types of questions about Oncotype DX that I was interested in looking at, I chose to use the SEER Medicare linked data, which combines the detailed clinical pathologic data from the SEER registry with the longitudinal claims from the Medicare data. So we use the Medicare claims portion of the SEER Medicare data to detect the use of Oncotype DX in our study population. Now there was no specific CPT um, uh, procedure code for Oncotype DX. In fact, the test is billed using the CPT code uh, 84999, which is defined as unlisted chemistry procedure. However, using the knowledge that all Oncotype DX tests are processed by a single provider in a single location, we were able to use an algorithm to detect the Oncotype DX code in the Medicare claims data and confirm that all tests were performed by the same single provider from the same single location with 95% of these tests having an identical payment of $3,414. So this was considered a very creative approach at the time. Again, this was a while ago. Um, and I believe ultimately the, uh, this creative approach is what got the study funded. But I've seen this approach recreated for other diagnostics many times since. And this is just a side note uh, to suggest that if you can think of novel ways to use data that have been around a long time, you can still make real contributions to the field. Um, interestingly, the SEER Medicare data now actually includes the Oncotype DX risk score data in, in the data set itself. Uh, but back then, this data was not publicly available. So we were only able to detect receipt of testing at the time, but did not know what the test results actually were. So we were able to show that Oncotype DX use in the real world increased over the study period, particularly within the younger age group in the SEER Medicare data. And since the use of Oncotype DX was supposed to inform whether or not a patient received chemotherapy, we wanted to see how often um, the, the use of the diagnostic, or sorry, we wanted to see how the, the use of the diagnostic was impacting the use of chemotherapy. And here we can see that in patients who would traditionally be considered high risk due to their tumor size or stage, that chemotherapy use appeared to decline following the introduction of Oncotype DX. So in multivariable analysis, we did not see an overall association between receipt of Oncotype DX and receipt of chemo. However, we did see that patients with clinical markers of more aggressive disease, such as tumor size, uh, grade, and NCCN defined clinical pathologic risk had an increased likelihood of receiving chemo. The most nuanced and interesting finding, however, was that when we looked at the interaction between receipt of Oncotype DX and NCCN defined clinical risk, we saw that receipt of Oncotype DX was associated with decreased chemo in NCC in high-risk patients and increased chemo in NCC in low-risk patients. So at the time, it was a foregone conclusion by many that the use of Oncotype DX would not only be cost-effective, but also cost-saving. However, there was a meta-analysis of the ability of Oncotype DX to reduce costs, um, and it revealed that there was a wide range in the perceived bene uh, cost benefits of Oncotype DX, according uh, to whether a study had been funded by Genomic Health, the sponsor, um, which is, uh, those studies are shown in blue on this graph as opposed to other funding sources. So interestingly, the five studies um, that suggested Oncotype DX was cost saving were all funded by Genomic Health. Ultimately, however, these were all modeling studies and we wanted to try to look at real world data. So this is important because when you look closely at these modeling studies, 18 of them uh, assumed that T-stage and tumor grade had no impact on chemotherapy decisions, which we clearly saw in the data I showed previously was not the case in our real world data. And only five studies accounted for the fact that Oncotype DX testing might actually increase chemotherapy use in clinically low risk patients. So what did we find when we looked at costs um, associated with Oncotype DX in the real world setting? So the main takeaway lesson was that the impact of these tests depends strongly on the patient population and pre-test likelihood that a patient was going to get chemotherapy anyway. So in patients who were planned for chemo or high risk patients, Oncotype DX uh, can, uh, can reduce costs, uh, chemo and costs. 
However, for low or intermediate patients, there is no evidence that Oncotype DX will reduce costs in actuality. And its, um, its use is actually associated with higher non-cancer costs, likely due to just general overall increased healthcare utilization in, in this population. And then finally, using these same data, we were able to look at questions regarding what physician or provider characteristics were associated with the use of Oncotype DX. And what we saw was that about 70% of patients who were receiving Oncotype DX had the Oncotype DX test ordered by their medical oncologist. But we were also able to look at factors, um, physician characteristics that were associated with, with increased likelihood of receiving Oncotype DX. And these were uh, having been seen by a surgical oncologist, um, having been seen, uh, having had your surgery at an academic medical center, having uh, been treated by a female medical oncologist, and having been treated by a medical oncologist who was within five years of uh, finishing their training. So I'm going to move on to my next example, which is from my current NCI-funded R01, where we are examining access and adherence to oral anti-cancer agents and drivers of real-world disparities in patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma. As is the case uh, in many cancers, the number of available therapies for kidney cancers uh, have expanded dramatically over the past decade and a half. And interestingly, 10 of these therapies, 10 of the therapies approved between 2005 and 2016, of those 10, seven of them were oral agents. And we can use real world data to look at issues pertaining to patients' ability to access and then stay adherent to these potentially life-saving drugs. So once again, let's take a look at what, what uh, was known versus the knowledge gaps surrounding OAA use in patients with kidney cancer at the time. So we, know, we knew that oral anti-cancer agents, uh, and we know that they pose unique challenges to delivery. And also there was clinical trial data that showed increased progression-free survival and overall survival for several different OAAs. Um, and typically OAAs have shown to have a more favorable toxicity profile uh, than uh, traditional cytotoxic chemotherapies. However, there continue to be uh, gaps in the knowledge uh, around whether outcomes, what outcomes and toxicities looked like in older and comorbid patient populations. Uh, there were few head-to-head -head OAA comparisons, um, and there were additional unknown adherence barriers as well as impacts of uh, out-of-cost uh, out-of-pocket costs on adherence and um, how the impact of non what the impact of non-adherence had on outcomes for these patients. So for this study, we once again decided to leverage the strengths of the SEER Medicare and the Medicare claims data. And in this case, Medicare Part D, which is, uh, includes prescription drug claims, was crucial for this study. But we also added an additional data source called the North Carolina Cipher data. Now, North Carolina Cipher is an example of a state cancer registry that's been linked to claims data. And in this case, it's the North Carolina cancer registries data that has been linked to Medicare, Medicaid, and Blue Cross Blue Shield data. So you can see here that strengths include the same detailed clinical pathologic data that's contained in the SEER Medicare data set, but for patients of all ages, where SEER Medicare is limited to those who are 65 years and older, and, uh, with, and Cypher has patients with different types of insurance coverage where SEER Medicare is limited, uh, obviously, to just the Medicare population. So here I show the SEER Medicare rates of utilization of oral anti-cancer agents in patients with uh, renal cell carcinoma. And we also reproduced this data in the North Carolina Cypher data where we saw highly similar trajectories and rates of uh, OAA agents. We found that roughly a third of patients were receiving an oral anti-cancer agent at all uh, within a year of being diagnosed with advanced disease and that the majority of these patients were initially treated with sunitinib. A uh, multivariable analysis of SEER Medicare factors associated with utilization did not show evidence of differential receipt of oral therapies by patient race, ethnicity, or socioeconomic status. However, we did see decreased utilization in patients who were unmarried, older, or that lived in the South. So one of the strengths of the North Carolina Cypher data is that it includes adults of all ages as well as private insurance, as I've already mentioned. Um, before we adjusted for age, there were large differences in utilization by private versus Medicare insurance. However, in multivariable adjusted analyses, we saw that there was no difference in OA utilization by insurance. Instead, this was likely driven entirely by age with older patients being less likely to receive therapy. 
We also observed that uh, frailty and having multiple comorbidities were both associated with decreased OAA utilization. And lastly, we looked at patients with all stages of kidney cancer and saw that patients who were diagnosed with stage one disease, but that experienced progression to metastatic disease were less likely to utilize an OAA within a year of metastatic disease diagnosis. And this is likely due to slower growing disease with a less urgent need to treat immediately. Um, for oral anti-cancer agents, however, it's important to remember that in addition to utilization, there's also the concept of adherence or the percentage of time a patient was taking their anti-cancer drug. We know that in general, adherence to oral medications is often far from 100% due to any number of reasons such as side effects or costs. Um, we looked at adherence in both the SEER Medicare and the Cypher cohorts, and we observed slightly higher rates of adherence within the North Carolina uh, uh, Cypher patient population as compared to the SEER Medicare cohort. We think this is largely due to the difference in age between the cohorts, as both cohorts showed evidence of either older patients or those with Medicare insurance having lower adherence rates. North Carolina Cypher was somewhat limited in power due to the smaller sample sizes, and it did not examine adherence by, uh, by different agents in the multivariable analysis. However, there was evidence of substantially lower adherence to serofinib in both cohorts. We saw a strong impact of poverty on adherence within the SEER Medicare data, but not the North Carolina Cypher data. And although it is unclear why, we hypothesize that older patients living on a fixed income may be more sensitive to financial stressors. Um, consistent with this, we saw that OAAs with out-of-pocket costs over $200 were associated with decreased adherence within the SEER Medicare cohort. So these real-world data sets also allow you to look at survival. And here's a three month landmark survival curve of all cause mortality for pizopinib users um, by whether they received the trial recommended dose of 800 uh, uh, milligrams of pizopinib per day in the three months following OAA initiation. Uh, for the patients getting the prescribed dose for the first three months of treatment, we saw superior outcomes and survival uh, was assessed beginning at three months post pizopinib initiation in order to avoid introducing immortal time bias in the analysis. So I think it's incredibly critical to acknowledge that a key limitation of all these data sets is that the patient perspective and the patient voice is missing. I also feel it's incredibly important to do our best to include this perspective, even when working exclusively with secondary data. And one way that we address this for the renal cell carcinoma OAA study was by partnering with uh, patient advocacy groups who helped us identify questions that were most important to them. So for example, these patients and their families, they wanted to know how often and providers were switching their medications, which is something um, we hadn't planned on examining, but we were absolutely capable of examining in our real world data set. So we looked um, at the request of the patients and we found that while only 6% of RCC patients switched OAAs within 90 days of diagnosis, uh, that, that number increased to 20% of RCC patients switched to their OAAs within one year of diagnosis. So now I'd like to move on uh, to an example of current uh, future work that I'm doing. So I was recently awarded an American Cancer Society five-year research scholar grant, and this grant will be developing uh, algorithms to inform risk stratified care for long-term cancer survivors. So this figure was modified from a paper by Effinger and McCabe, which shows um, at the top the current model of care for cancer survivors, which is more of a one-size-fits-all approach. Once a patient is diagnosed with their cancer, um, their care is transferred to an oncologist for an indefinite period of time with little to no ongoing participation from the PCP. The bottom shows a proposed shared practice model of care based on risk stratification, which helps to inform the point in time when a, a cancer survivor's care might be appropriately transferred back to or shared with the primary care physician, with the idea being that the new model represents both a more efficient and better quality model of care. So this figure is from a study where McConnell and colleagues used national cancer registry data from the UK and Northern Ireland to risk stratify patients with 20 of the most common cancers into three uh, groups based on overall survival at one in five years from diagnosis. And this uh, is just to demonstrate that crude risk categorization is possible and is currently being used to inform treatment in other countries. So the authors noted that important caveats of this analysis included the absence of treatment information, which was not available, and uh, that their data was unable to assess treatment related complications, both of which I propose to improve upon in our models for this ACS grant. 
Uh, so once again, we return to existing, um, currently existing knowledge gaps, which real world data and outcome methodologies can help to address. So we know that oncologic and non-oncologic risks vary substantially by cancer stage and treatment um, and cancer type. We also know that cancer site and stage alone can provide broad oncologic risk categories. However, non-oncologic uh, disease risks have defi been defined uh, qualitatively, but not uh, quantitatively in cancer survivors. And um, we do not know how um, oncologic and on uh, non-oncologic risks uh, compare or compete uh, within uh, cancer survivors. And there's also a need to estimate uh, these risks at the point of care. So we will once again use the CIR Medicare and the North Carolina Cipher data, but the new data set uh, addition to this project will be incorporating data from the Veterans Health As System. And the overarching plan is to use inputs that are available from all three of these data sets, such as cancer specific variables like site and stage and treatment, personal characteristics like age and gender and uh, race and, and ethnicity, and then aging related concerns like comorbidities and functional status um, to develop risk prediction models and breast, uh, breast, prostate and colorectal cancers to predict both oncologic and non-oncologic events for which long-term cancer survivors are at increased risk. So these risk algorithms will separate long-term cancer survivors into low, medium, and high-risk categories to help inform discussions between survivors and physicians about their optimal care going forward. And ultimately, the final product will be a freely available web calculator in which patients and or physicians can input their individual information to help categorize their individual risk and inform pathways of care. So next on the horizon for me is tackling additional unmet needs of traditional health services research through novel data linkages. And I'm developing studies that will include actual physical tumor samples so that we can run genomic sequence analyses on them and then link that additional biologic information to both tumor registry data and longitudinal claims data. So there are a couple existing resources, which I've already tapped into to get this work off the ground. And the first of which is the SEER Residual Tissue Repository, which is a program that used to be funded by NCI to maintain physical tumor samples for patients contained in the SEER registries for three participating sites, which were Iowa, Hawaii, and Los Angeles, California. So um, like I said, the RTR program uh, consists of pathologic specimens. These are old specimens. They were collected between 1992 and 2006. I've already mentioned the participating SEER registries, uh, but they do allow the ability to physically analyze tumor samples. And so what I did was um, we recently um, completed a proof of concept study on a very small breast cancer cohort to demonstrate the process for combining the SEER, the Medicare, and the genomic or biologic data obtained from running gene expression analyses on the tumor samples themselves. So unfortunately, LA did not participate in this pilot study due to an inability to procure large enough funds to cover their participation costs. And this left us with two very distinct uh, and racially and ethnically homogenous populations, which were not was not ideal. Uh, we would have liked to have been much more representative, but it did allow us to proceed with the proof of concept study. Um, and here's a brief uh, summary of some of our major findings. So this publication is in press and will be published in two days in JAMA Network. And I'm happy to share that publication with folks to go through in more detail once it's published. But you can see that our major findings really show how we were able to leverage the different aspects of these three different data linkage, the three different data sets that we linked together. So we were able to show from the Medicare claims data that symptomatic detection of breast cancer was associated with a higher mortality hazards ratio. As um, from the SEER registry data, we were able to show that um, uh, low levels of high school graduation rates uh, were associated with a higher mortal uh, mortality hazards ratio. And then from the tumor samples and the genetic analyses that we conducted on these, we were able to show that androgen receptor, macrophage cytotoxicity, and Treg signaling uh, were all associated with reduced mortality. But the, the key thing that I want to highlight here is that factors related to socioeconomic status and screening access remained associated with mortality even after adjusting for clinical and genomic factors. So what does the future look like for this work? Well, I'm getting ready to submit an R01, which would leverage the SEER virtual tissue repository and proposes the first in-kind linkage ever of the SEER VTR tumor samples with SEER and Medicare longitudinal claims. So the SEER VTR 
consists of seven participating SEER registries. So we're, we're up to seven from three. And the pathologic specimen location is known uh, for the most recent 10 years. So this is current, this is the, the oldest the tissue samples are, are 10 years old, um, but the, the collection is ongoing. So these are recent tissues. And once again, we must physically request and fund the acquisition of the pathologic specimens um, from the pathology labs storing them. But what are we proposing to do? So we're calling this a retrogenomic approach, which we are defining as a combination of population level cohort studies, followed by retrospect retrospective selection of patient cases in which to pursue genomic analyses. And this allows us to bypass a common weakness of traditional trials where patients are assigned to specific groups and then we wait to see what outcomes they have. In this approach, we can use the Medicare claims data to cherry pick specific outcomes of interest and then go and pull the tumor samples for the patients who experience these outcomes in the real world and study which treatment patterns, SES factors, or clinical pathologic characteristics appear to be driving those outcomes. And in the case of our RCC proposal that we're getting ready to submit in February, February, we're going to look at two rare events experienced by patients related to aminotherapy, namely severe IO toxicities and durable responders. So we're calling this project the Virtual SEER Tissue Registry Genomics and Medicare Cohort, or a VERGE cohort. And as I mentioned, our first application to go in will be in renal cell carcinoma, since this study will be following on the heels of my current R01. But our intention always has been and remains to have several different VERGE cohorts across different disease sites answering all types of different clinical questions. So in summary, there are many questions relevant to cancer care that can be informed and enhanced by real world health services research. Uh, many questions cannot be feasibly or ethically addressed by clinical trials alone and novel linkages may pave the way to novel opportunities in health services research. There are several data sets that are available for research uh, in real world outcomes uh, data and each data has its own strengths, weaknesses and nuances that you need to know how to work with in order to get the best uh, and most accurate data. And then the incorporation of genomics and biology into health service research is on the horizon. Um, with that, I want to thank the team members who participated in all the various studies that I, uh, that I presented today. All of the work I do is team-based science, and I couldn't do it without the clinical collaborators and the support staff who are helping me with this work. So thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Michaela. Very interesting work. Um, if there are any questions, I, I guess what we do is we um, type them into the chat. Um, while we're waiting, I had a question. I, I thought the most interesting thing you showed was the effect of zip code, mm. the five-fold increase in mortality. Yes. Because of course, in, within a zip code, there are many people, there's a range of educational levels. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you just actually broke it down, are you able to break it down by actual, whether or not a patient has graduated or not? Because I would assume then that yeah. difference would be much greater. Yeah, I mean, so obviously that would be ideal. Um, that's just that's just a limitation of the SEER Medicare data. So the the data uh, the uh, SES uh, data is in this uh, in, available in the SEER Medicare data, and I could talk a whole another half hour about this. Um, is zip code level information. So it's not ideal, but it does give you a sense of you you get zip code level information about high school graduation, zip code level uh, information about poverty, um, about uh, um, like the racial or ethnic makeup of a, a neighborhood somebody lives in. So obviously it's a proxy, it's not ideal, but um, it's it's better than what's in a lot of other data sets, so. It's, it's still, despite those very, very striking difference. Um, we have a question from Lausch. Yes, hi, and congratulations. It's really very exciting what you described. I, I wonder who is your Yale collaborator or co-investigator for the genomic analysis piece of your R01? So who yeah. will actually do the, the sequencing and the data analysis and linking to the clinical data? Yeah, so we're still working through the details of that, but we've been talking to all the various cores and thinking about exactly what um, what we want to do uh, in terms of the uh, ge uh, genomic analyses. Obviously, there's a couple things that are going to weigh in. Um, it, this is a big study. It, like I said, it's going to involve, it's all of the CRPIs from all of the six registries I mentioned are all on board. We're going to have, so that'll be six sites. Um, and so a, a lot of this, unfortunately, is going to be driven by what we can afford um, in terms of, you know, so we're going to start with a very focused analysis. And then from there, you know, I'm hoping to build uh, on that with either um, uh, administrative supplements or other funding mechanisms to build out and expand on that. So that's still that that specific piece is still, still being in development right now, but we're talking with all of the Yale cores. Yeah. 
So I'd love to follow up with you because, you know, I, I co-direct the Yale Genetics Genomics Program. And you may know that we have a similar large initiative that's run by um, Mike Murray, the Generations Project. And I think there is a lot of synergy that you could, you could leverage. Yeah, it'd be great to talk. Um, we're, still, we're still developing that specific piece, so I would love to talk about it more. Uh, thanks, Lash. Um, any other questions or comments? How, uh, Michaela, the, the, the work is obviously critically dependent on how good the data sets are. Um, which you have not a lot of control over other than selecting which ones to use. I mean, for example, are the VA, how does that compare to SEER? How does that compare to Medicare? Are, are there systematic differences? Yeah, so um, great question. Again, I have a whole nother talk just talking specifically <laughs> about these. these next, next week. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it's all about, like I said, like knowing the data sets well, knowing what their strengths or weaknesses are and knowing how to leverage them. So specifically for the risk stratification grant that I'm talking about, where we're going to be using SEER, Medicare, Cypher and the VA data, we're, we're specifically focusing um, the variables of interest on things that we know we can get out of each of those three data sets. Right. So because we want to be able to like develop and then uh, validate the risk prediction algorithms. I mean, I, I said it from the beginning, there's no perfect data set. Um, there are things that are really strong about this year Medicare data. It is probably the most widely used uh, real world data set for oncology specific research. It's an incredibly strong data set. But the two big um, limitations that everyone can tell you right off the top of their head is that it's limited to those who are 65 years and older. It's Medicare only. And then the other limitation is there's a pretty significant lag with the data because it relies on a linkage that's done every two years at uh, NCI. So it's usually about three to four years behind, right? So if you're trying to look at emerging technologies, it can be a little bit of a nuisance. So from the current R01, where we're using SEER Medicare data, actually getting ready to purchase a cohort of the Medicare 100% data. So the limitation to that data set is gonna be that it doesn't have the SEER registry information. So we're not gonna know things like stage, um, or like uh, other clinical pathologic variables. However, the whole, you know, we're trying to fill in the gaps that we know exist from the previous work that we did with the other data sets, which is the lag that we saw in, in the SEER Medicare data and the North Carolina Cypher data. So we can't look at OAAs in the context of current immunotherapy, which we know is playing a huge role in uh, renal cell carcinoma um, treatment right now. So the Medicare claims data, while it will have different gaps, is gonna allow us to look at other questions alongside of what we've already done to look at how OAA, utili OAA utilization and adherence looks um, in the context of immunotherapies. So it's just about figuring out, like, it's just about acknowledging where the limitations exist and then figuring out a way to kind of fill that information in. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. We need to move on to our second speaker, um, who's uh, Gloria Wong. And Gloria is a um, social professor of OBGYN and reproductive sciences here. And she specializes in the treatment and prevention of, of ovarian, uterine, and cervical cancers. She's a board certified gynecologic oncologist who performs minimally invasive surgery. And her research interests are in endometriosis associated ovarian cancer and the prevention and treatment of endometrial cancer recurrence. So um, Gloria, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction, and I really enjoyed uh, the first talk and learned a lot. So uh, let me just see if I can bring up my slides here. Can you see those? Yes. Could you put in presentation? Uh, yes. Yep, How's perfect. that? Perfect. Great. All right. Well, um, today I wanted to talk about a couple of topics uh, near and dear to my heart, which is translational science and pivotal trials in gynecological cancer. Um, I have my disclosures on file with the CME office, none of which are related to the content of this presentation. In this talk, I want to first give a a brief overview of the epidemiology and current trends in GYN cancer, challenges and successes in the field of GYN cancer research, including highlighting some recent practice changing trials, and an example of how translational science um, in my personal experience can be a driver for clinical trial development and team science. And then also just touch briefly on some resources available for translational research. And these are the learning objectives. 
endometrial cancer has been increasing in both incidence and mortality in the United States. Currently, the lifetime risk of developing endometrial cancer is about one in 32, and over 800,000 women in the US are living with endometrial cancer. Ovarian cancer mortality has um, slightly declined in recent years, and currently the lifetime risk of developing ovarian cancer is about one in 83, and over 200,000 women in the US are living with ovarian cancer. In the US, thanks to uh, HPV vaccination and cervical screening, the cervical cancer rate has declined over the past decades to about one in 167 women. Um, however, there are significant disparities um, related to access of care and uh, affecting outcomes. Chewine cancers arise from the reproductive tract organs, including the ovary, fallopian tube, uterus, cervix, vulva, and vagina. And um, these organs are remarkable in their ability to respond rapidly to endocrine signals, produce sex hormones, and their remarkable capacity for proliferation, regeneration, and morphological changes. And some of these do relate to underlying risk factors and protective factors for GYN cancers. For ovarian cancer, there's a correlation with increased lifetime ovulatory cycles, whereas oral contraceptive use pregnancy and, risk, and breastfeeding decrease risk. Um, we now that um, uh, germline genetic testing has become much more widespread and may um, you know, be available to the general public, um, it is available now for uh, out-of-pocket uh, cost for you know, about $250 um, to determine if one carries a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. And for those patients, risk-reducing surgery is highly protective. For women at average risk, there is a benefit to opportunistic salpingectomies. So um, uh, surgical removal of the fallopian tubes at the time of other pelvic surgery for benign indications. Endometrial cancer um, is linked to the rising obesity rate uh, unopposed estrogen, as well as hereditary factors. And we know that use of progestin containing oral contraceptive pills or progestin IUD can offer protection as well as risk reducing surgery for patients at higher risk. And um, cervical cancer um, can be uh, really eliminated with widespread implementation of HPV vaccination and cervical screening, which currently consists mainly of liquid cytology and high-risk HPV detection. We are still facing notable challenges in the field of GYN cancer. And um, I'm gonna to focus today on endometrial cancer, which has an increasing incidence and mortality rate, as well as substantial racial disparity in outcomes. However, this is um, buffeted by recent successes and pivotal trials in GYN cancer in just in the past 18 months alone, we've seen new first-line maintenance therapy options for ovarian cancer, new indications for immunotherapy, including for mismatch repair proficient endometrial cancer, as well as new first-line and second-line standard of care for cervical cancer. So really quite um, amazing how many pivotal trials have resulted in the recent um, 18, uh, 18 to 24 months leading to um, practice changing uh, approaches. Um, so uh, in end of 2019, the results of um, Prima and Paula 1 were published in the New England Journal, leading to the approval of two different options for first-line maintenance therapy of epithelial ovarian cancer, fallopian tube, or primary peritoneal cancer following complete or partial response to first-line platinum-based chemotherapy. The um, niraparib um, demonstrated a significant improvement in progression-free survival in uh, both the overall intent to treat population and the homologous recombination deficient population with a hazard risk of 0.43 in progression-free survival um, with clear divergence of the um, uh, progression-free survival curves. Um, similarly, um, Paolo 1, which tested a laparib 
and bevacizumab for first line maintenance sh um, showed a remarkable improvement in progression free survival. Um, on the upper left in the BRCA mutated population hazard ratio of 0 0.31. And on the lower right, um, patients without a BRCA mutation, but with a molecular test um, demonstrating homologous recombination deficiency as tested by genomic instability um, also showed a uh, progression-free survival benefit with a hazard ratio of 0 0.4. Uh, in outcomes for patients who unfortunately often prevent, present with advanced um, stage ovarian cancer. And um, we know that after, upon recurrence becomes more difficult to treat and um, more likely to be chemo resistant. In endometrial cancer, just to review some of our recent exciting um, um, new, new options, and this has been really um, a big deal because actually progress has been quite slow in endometrial cancer. Um, uh, progestin therapy, Megase, was approved, you know, many decades ago for palliative uh, treatment of endome uh, endometrial and breast cancer. Um, however, really many decades elapsed without any new trials, uh, new indicate indicated therapies for endometrial cancer. A, a big um, a benefit for our patients with endometrial cancer was seen with the accelerated approval of pembrolizumab for um, in it, solid tumors that were mismatch repair deficient, um, as about 20% of endometrial cancers are, or microsatellite instability high, um, or more recently with the addition of the accelerated approval for the tumor mutation burden high um, tumors. Um, more recently, this year, um, we have an additional option for mismatch repair deficient endometrial cancer, um, Dostarlamab, which received accelerated approval in um, August. And then most recently, um, the uh, Keynote 775 updated results were presented at ESMO following previous um, presentation at SGO showing combination of pembrolizumab and lymphatinib um, showing actually this combination in proficient mismatch repair proficient endometrial cancers um, and improvement in overall survival um, leading to regular approval of this combination for patients with endometrial cancer that is not MSI high, that is mismatch repair proficient and have disease progression following prior systemic therapy. Um, next, I wanna move into um, how we as clinician scientists participate and a, a example for trial in progress that I'd like to share. So I have um, a couple of different projects moving into clinical trials. This one that's currently in enrolling in clinical trial um, and emerged from what began as a collaborative um, team science project that, um, funded by an R01. And then another um, trial, which I'm in the process of um, uh, moving towards the clinic, um, which is um, which I won't talk about today, um, which was based on translational science done in my lab supported by a DOD grant. Um, for this study, which began quite a long time ago, um, I collaborated with um, ep um, epidemi cancer epidemiology experts, and we wanted to ask the question of what could what we know about the development of endometrial cancer and how obesity is a major risk factor for type 1 endometrial cancer, which has been increasing steadily and underlies um, the primary increase in the endometrial cancer incidence, as shown here in this graph. Uh, let's see. Um, and it's also a de the declining rate of hysterectomy is another contributing factor. Um, what was known and for many studies, including prospective study of the um, Women's Health Initiative, that some of the underlying biological mechanisms 
um, linking obesity to endometrial cancer include increased um, estrogen levels, increased bioavailability of estrogens, and insulin resistance. Um, and the question that we asked was, do these factors that underlie the development of endometrial cancer, do they play a role in the recurrence and progression of women diagnosed with endometrial cancer? Um, for this study, we utilized the tissue biorepository of the GOG210 study. This is a study that was um, over 60 sites around the U US at our GOG, gynecologic oncology group sites, um, now under the auspices of NRG Oncology, um, enrolled patients who were undergoing standard surgical care for endometrial cancer. And um, prospective specimen banking was performed and um, uh, sent to a centralized tissue bank, the GOG tissue bank, and, um, and prospective um, epidemiological surveys and outcomes, treatment and outcomes data was obtained in order to facilitate translational research, including um, a variety of molecular and genetic uh, genomic assays and um, data integration. So we proposed a, a study within this GOG210 cohort, um, which we obtained funding for. And this focused on the patients who had endometrioid histology. And um, we investigated the sex hormone and insulin, insulin-like growth factor signaling pathways implicated in the development of endometrial cancer to determine if these factors were related to the recurrence or progression of higher risk endometrioid endometrial cancers. And this study included over 800 women of whom 35% experienced a recurrence in, in a follow-up of over five years. The, um, the methods, the models were adjusted for known clinical risk factors of recurrence, including age, stage, and grade, which were all significant risk factors for um, recurrence. And just to um, summarize some of the interesting findings, um, which we presented at an ASCO plenary and we published this year in um, Cancer Epidemiology, MPD, CEBP, um, we found that circulating estradiol is positively associated with recurrence risk independent of other factors. Um, and in addition, um, a particular tissue biomarker that I was interested in based on some of my laboratory research, that phosphorylated expression of insulin receptor, IGF-1 receptor, was also independently associated with recurrence risk. And this is an example of um, immunohistochemical staining for um, the phosphorylated activated form of the receptor. Um, because of the you know, large number of patients, we did utilize high throughput approaches for this um, study, which included construction of tissue microarrays and, um, and, uh, and real-time PCR. So the translational impact of these findings is that we identified novel sex hormone and insulin IGF axis tissue and circulating biomarkers of recurrence in a prospective study of high stage endometrioid endometrial cancer. And this led to um, a motivation to test strategies to target these pathways um, for prevention and treatment of endometrial cancer and endometrial cancer recurrence. Um, in my lab, we um, looked at different uh, potential therapies for um, treating endometrial cancer that could be superior to the previously um, used strategies. Um, so the most commonly used strategies in, in the past have been progestin agents, um, aromatase inhibitors, or combination tamoxifen and megase. Um, and all of those resulted in really modest efficacy with progression-free survivals, even in the first line setting of around three months. Um, so this indicated a need for more effective, um, effective approaches for endocrine therapy. 
And we found both in, in um, cell line models, we found that um, com combination um, cyclin D uh, kinase uh, CDK4-6 inhibition with aromatase inhibitors was potently synergistic in endometrial cancer cell lines. And, um, and this is something that um, has been very successfully implemented, of course, in estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And um, this just shows in vivo data of showing on the y-axis the tumor volumes of the endometrial cancer xenograft and this was um, a RB wild type. As expected, we found that RB mutant endometrial cancers are not responsive to this combination. And um, you could see in the red that the combination therapy was um, significantly superior to either agent alone um, and both, and uh, much uh, was really able to inhibit growth of this aggressive endometrial cancer xenograft. Um, and this is work we presented at the AACR meeting. Um, and this led me to um, initiate a collaboration guided by valuable input from you know, my division colleagues here at Yale, um, who of course are leading clinical um, researchers, as well as um, uh, colleagues in, in breast cancer, um, like uh, Dr. Pushtai and um, my colleague, Dr. Santine, incorporating their input, I was able to successfully submit a concept for a clinical trial um, for, um, to, uh, to be supported by Lilly and um, in collaboration with um, leading clinical trialists in GYN oncology and the G in the GOG group, which is a, our major cooperative group for research. Um, we, um, we actually were able to successfully propose and um, activate an investigator initiated trial, which is GOG 3039, a phase two study of abemacyclib in combination with letrozole advanced recurrent or metastatic endometrioid endometrial cancer. This is a phase two single arm trial to evaluate the efficacy of this drug combination for endometrial and endometrial cancer with dosing based on the current FDA approval for combination therapy in breast cancer. Um, the study endpoints is to evaluate the efficacy. And in addition, the translational research um, component, which is all being done here at Yale, um, we are um, uh, collecting uh, longitudinally um, whole, uh, whole blood, for cell-free DNA, as well as F FFPE of the tissue samples for exploratory analysis and identification of novel biomarkers of response. And how does this trial, the GOG 3039 trial, um, fit into the rapidly evolving landscape of treatment for endometrial cancer? Well, surgery, hysterectomy, removal of the tubes and ovaries and nodal evaluation is still the cornerstone of patients presenting with resectable endometrial cancer. Following surgery, low and, and intermediate risk patients are managed with observation, while high intermediate risk patients standard of care um, receive radiation therapy or vaginal brachytherapy with the potential benefit of the addition of pembrolizumab for mismatch repair deficient patients being um, evaluated. In this trial, we have open here, which is the GYO20. Um, for high risk, higher risk patients following surgery um, who are fully resected, adjuvant therapy um, includes chemotherapy, usually taxon carboplatin, um, with um, individualized, individualized radiation, radiation therapy, often including pelvic radiation if there's pelvic nodal involvement and whether or not pembrolizumab is gonna offer additional benefit to reduce the risk of distant mets in these higher risk women is being evaluated in Keynote um, B21. And what about first line therapy for advanced patients, measurable disease, metastatic disease, or recurrent disease? Um, so the standard of care currently is um, chemotherapy, 
with GOG 209 showing taxol carbo doublet therapy as, you, as adopted from ovarian cancers is seems to be more tolerable than um, triplet therapy. So that's become the standard of care and whether or not pembrolizumab um, will improve outcomes in these patients um, who have a very high risk of progression and recurrence is being evaluated in GYO18, also actively enrolling. And in this patient population where NCC and guidelines also um, describe hormonal therapy as an option, um, would definitely consider um, GOG39 for these patients who would be eligible. And what about in the second line uh, setting? Currently, we have um, standard of care options um, for patients who progressed on previous chemo, and those include for mismatch repair deficient, pembrolizumab or dostarlamab. And then for the MMR proficient, we saw that pembrolizumab and, and lenvatinib combination perform better than physician's choice of second line chemo. Um, in the GYN DART portfolio, we have a number of biomarker-driven therapies being evaluated in a phase two setting. Um, and these are led by Dr. Santine, a folate receptor alpha targeting antibody drug conjugate, as well as a trope two targeting anti antibody drug conjugate. Um, and certainly for endometrioid, endometrioid cancer um, would, uh, would, would recommend consideration of GOG39 for these patients. So patients um, are eligible for GOG3039 um, with up to two prior systemic regimens, one of which could have been chemo, one of which could have been immunotherapy. And um, we actually have activated over 20 sites of the 25 um, selected sites and um, have really been having rapid accrual with um, the current rate of accrual exceeding our expectation of one, and it's currently one to two patients per week for this trial, which if it goes to second stage would enroll a maximum of 52 patients. Um, I just wanted to briefly touch on, since this is relatively new, is this NCTN Navigator clinical trial specimen resource, and it's available for validation of hypotheses following um, already completed exploratory and pilot studies. And this includes a very vast number of specimens, including a lot of the specimens that were transferred over from the GOG tissue bank. And um, there is a workflow available for exploring what specimens are available and um, submitting for, um, for access to these specimens for, for addressing research questions that may require a large number of samples um, that are um, collected in a very rigorous way. Um, and then how do we fund translational research um, in the area of some declining um, support? Um, one of the mechanisms um, which has been super valuable for um, supporting translational support is the SPORE mechanism which of course Yale has been very successful and has spores in head and neck, lung and skin cancer. Um, there are very few GYN funded spores currently, only one in endometrial, one in cervical, a five in ovarian, and there's one new um, uh, uh, spore in, that focuses on health disparities in endometrial and ovarian cancer. Um, so I hope I've uh, relayed some of my enthusiasm for team science and it's essential ingredient for translational science and conduct of clinical trials for GYN cancers, which are relatively rare cancers, and a really way for um, having exciting and meaningful impact. And I hope I've, uh, I hope to, uh, you'll uh, people who are interested in collaborating will contact me in my emails listed here. Thank you, Gloria. Very interesting, very exciting to see the progress that's been made in all these trials that are underway, that are underway. People can please uh, in, um, uh, type your questions into the chat while we're waiting. Um, you might wanna to talk to Roy Herbst if you haven't. He's sort of taken the lead on trying to organize new spores and has quite a bit of experience. So he might be someone to talk to. It'd be great to have a spore in this, in this area. 
in the um, Piola trial, it, it, it was comparing BRCA positive to BRCA negative patients. Was that BRCA one or two or, or, or both? Did they, did they stratify that? So in the data that was published in the paper, um, at least not in the main manuscript, I don't recall um, seeing a stratification of the um, BRCA1 versus BRCA2. Um, they did um, show the um, hazard ratios and um, PFS uh, curves for a few different groups, and that included the BRCA tumor mutation positive the BRCA tumor mutation positive and HRD positive, and then the BRCA tumor mutation negative or wild type and HRD positive. Um, and then for, so the, um, for that trial, the, um, the benefit was seen in the BRCA positive, BRCA mutated or the HRD positive um, which in that trial was determined by the Myriad, my choice, HRD thing. Um, and um, there was not a clinical benefit in the HR proficient BRCA wild type group. Okay. Um, but that's an interesting question about if there are differences between BRCA one or two um, mutated which I'm not sure. I'll look into that though. Okay, all right, good. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? If not, well, thank you, Gloria. It was very interesting. And also Michaela, I thought we had a terrific series today and we'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye.